Hello, this is Dr. Jack Jackson. In this playlist, we will cover the lectures for week three of my course on the history of mathematics. The topic this week and next week will be on ancient Greek mathematics. The core of these slides are based upon the lectures of my colleague and professor emeritus of history, mathematics, and statistics, Todd Timmons, PhD. Thanks, Dr. Timmons, for allowing me to use your materials. So in this video, we're going to talk about some of the earliest Greek uh, mathematics. Now, notice that when we talk about Greece and Greek culture and, and mathematics, we're talking about a much larger geographic region than the modern-day country of Greece. Certainly, the birthplace of Greek culture is here in, in this section, which is part of modern-day Greece, right? But um, it was it expanded well beyond this region, eventually expanded to be very large and its influence. And it, it certainly included some of the largest and most influential city-states like, uh, you know, Athens and Thebes and Argos and Sparta and, uh, you know, Olympia and, and some different ones, others that are in here in this area. Okay. But it included, you know, many others. But this entire map, this entire region included uh, influences of Greek uh, culture. And so we're going to talk about ancient Greece. We're really kind of talking about all of this area, including uh, this area over here in Asia Minor. For example, 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 Miletus here is going to be an important city for us early on. In uh, that's where that's where Thales was, for example, and uh, and it, and even beyond this area that we see in this region. Okay, so this region is called Asia Minor over here, and that's present-day Turkey. Uh, notice all the water here. See, they got the Ionian Sea, the Aegean Sea, Thracian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and so forth. All these little gulfs and things all around this area. And so um, that is uh, imp important because what that ends up doing is the Greeks then were a seafaring culture. And they extra traveled extensively by ship, of course by land as well, but extensively by ship. They had lots of interaction with other uh, regions and other cultures, uh, the Egyptians, Babylonians, Phoenicians. Their interaction led to influence of ideas and knowledge about various things, including mathematics. And even in ancient times, Greek culture extended well beyond the original and current Greek region. This is a map from Encyclopedia Britannica online, and we can see the expansion over time of some of the... Uh, Greeks, Greeks, of course, the Greek cities were originally here, but these are some settlements that, that spaced out. Look, by the 6th century, you had things as far as, well, it looks like there's one out here actually on the Atlantic Ocean out here in, in present-day Spain there. Uh, we've got all around the Black Sea, uh, down here in, uh, in Egypt and uh, uh, northern Africa across here. As well as you know, a good chunk of Italy and, and different things. Syracuse, for example, is here. That's where uh, Archimedes was. Um, and so there's there's lots of lots of uh, of interesting um, expansion of the Greek culture throughout this entire region. Uh, another big culture that was available uh, at the same town of at the same time was the Phoenicians. This area right here. And the darker purple was sort of the Phoenician homeland. This darker Greece was all kind of the original Greece part, Greek, uh, part of Greece. And then the Phoenicians really expanded and traveled all the way out into here, even even up into, looks like they even maybe went up into the southern part of, of uh, Great Britain and uh, really traveled a lot by, by ship here. And then, of course, the, uh, the Greeks also as well. You can see the, the areas that they kind of colonized uh, eventually, or at least uh, had a lot of influence early on. Here are a few of the more important Greek uh, city-states, and they, they, had, they actually had city-states. So each one of these cities is kind of an independent uh, state. Uh, they, they did some, sometimes they controlled or, or uh, 
had in, in their control other little smaller city-states in their region. So these different regions, like, like for example, Sparta, here is one of the major city-states, and it kind of controlled, most of the time controlled a region something like this, this region mark 17 here. You've got Athens here with Marathon nearby, Thebes, Delphi, uh, Olympia, Argos, Corinth there, and different ones. Uh, we also have Miletus out here. We've mentioned down here at Rhodes. We've got uh, Crete's a big island there. There's the island of Les Lesbos uh, all the way up into here. You also had, uh, there's Mount Olympus there where the gods were supposed to have lived. Uh, Croton is important because uh, that's where um, Pythagoras ended up. He started over here on the island of Samos and then ended up over here at Croton. Uh, Syracuse, for example, down here in Sicily. Uh, this is modern day Italy, Sicily over here. Syracuse is where um, Archimedes was. So there, you know, there are a lot of Greek important city states there. Okay. So all of these uh, are, are considered Greek cities. So one of the, in these Greek city-states, they, they were more or less independent states, and they, um, they kind of had their own culture. There's sort of an overriding Greek culture for all of them, but they also had their own kind of independent ways of thinking about things. Uh, they, they had an upper class that had enough time to consider higher thinking. It's enough leisure time. So to think about a minute, if you have a person that spends all their time just trying to stay alive as a hunter-gatherer, they don't have much time to devote to higher intellectual pursuits. So you have to have the rise of a class of folks that has a little bit of time uh, to think. And of course, part of the way you do that is you have a lower class or, or even slaves that help support the upper class. So not so good for those folks. But for the upper class, it, it afforded them a little time to spend in some intellectual pursuits. And the Greeks, uh, they had that. They had their more fluent citizens and they were afforded that time. They were encouraged to discuss and debate intellectual matters, take part in the government of their city. In fact, a democratic government was first originated in Athens. And then the early Greek mathematicians uh, participated in this kind of thing. And some of them, uh, a lot of them actually traveled because as we said, this is a, a very traveling seafaring uh, society. And so, uh, early mathematicians like Thales and Pythagoras traveled to Egypt and some of them traveled to Babylon and other areas in the region, bringing back new knowledge and techniques. So the Greeks would have known about uh, some of the earlier mathematics that we talked about from Babylon and, and Egypt, for example. And they brought some of this Mesopotamian ideas and particularly the idea, Egyptian geometry was important that they brought to Greece. Now, before we go any further, we should note that very few primary sources of mathematics exist in, in pretty much any ancient culture. There are some primary e Egyptian monuments and uh, papyrus with mathematics. And, of course, we have quite a few Babylonian cuneiform mathematical tablets exist because they're a little more sturdy. But absolutely no primary sources of mathematics in ancient Greece have ever been found. So even though we have these original artifacts from much older Egyptian and Mesopotamian cultures were kind of out of luck with, with the primary sources in uh, Greece. So like the Egyptians of the time, the Greeks wrote on papyrus, but unfortunately the climate in the area was not as dry in Egypt, so making the preservation of papyrus much more difficult. So that's why a lot of it's lost. In addition, there's a problem that we have throughout history, and is that various groups in power often want to eliminate any traces of earlier cultures that they feel are contrary to their religion or culture. And many times entire libraries have been purposefully destroyed, as well as some that have been destroyed accidentally. So, in the end, we only have copies of copies of copies, uh, abridgments, summaries, later references to earlier works. We might have a copy of a copy of a copy of a work by one mathematician making reference to a work by another mathematician, but we don't have that other mathematician's work. Sometimes a translation of this other work might be found centuries later, maybe in Arabic or some other language, and sometimes these works have just been lost thus far and perhaps probably forever. 
So it's always a bit of a detective puzzle for the for the uh, archaeologists and the math, uh, the historians and the math historians to go back and try to piece together from what sources we have to try to reconstruct what was actually happened in these ancient times. And that's certainly true in ancient Greece. So the earliest sources that we have for Greek mathematics date to around 500 CE, even though we can deduce some of what happens back in Greek mathematics back to around 650 BCE. Greece, the birthplace of mathematics. Well, why in the world would we state such a, such a statement? Why would we say that ancient Greece is where modern mathematics began? Well, certainly there's, there's some counter uh, arguments that there was significant applied mathematics prior to the 6th century BCE uh, Greeks in many cultures, including Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, China, and other places. Well, the reason we say that is because around 6th century BCE, the Greeks began to insist on the idea that mathematical concepts must be explained and justified. They developed the idea of an axiomatic system, rules of logic, deduction, and formal proofs. And these are the heart of mathematics. So mathematics there became an important intellectual pursuit. Pure mathematics became an idealized system. It was used to train the mind for making all kinds of arguments. Mathematics was no longer confined, confined to practical applications. Of course, they had practical applications like everybody else. But with the way they looked at mathematics, it was something above and beyond that. And mathematics became one of the main subjects to be learned by the educated class. Of course, that was an elite few, but that was some, the main subject they learned. Uh, Greek axiomatic geometry in particular became the bedrock of Western mathematics. Greece is also the birthplace of logic and philosophy. Those kind of all came hand in hand. The philosophers were also the logicians and the uh, mathematicians, particularly the geometers. And Greek mathematics and philosophy then are the foundation ultimately of the entire Western civilization. So this was, this was kind of where it all got started. So Greek philosophers held mathematics above all other studies due to its logical structure and its seeming disassociation from the real world. Here's a quote from Proclus. This, therefore, is mathematics. She reminds you of the invisible form of the soul. She gives life to her own discoveries. She awakens the mind and purifies the intellect. She brings light to our intrinsic ideas. She abolishes oblivion and ignorance, which are ours by birth. Well, that's a, that's a uh, contrast that with Egyptian and Mesopotamian applied mathematics. We've come a long way from mathematics as just something to, uh, to solve practical problems in commerce and agriculture and, and other things. And now we've got mathematics as this kind of idealized uh, intellectual pursuit. And so Greek education, including that with philosophy and mathematics, was taught at loosely organized schools. And these are usually formed around one great teacher. And sometimes these schools survived the death of the teacher. Sometimes they did not. So schools formed around the great mathematicians such as Thales and Pythagoras and, and Plato, uh, Eudoxus, and Aristotle, among others. So um, Greek mathematics also gave the rise to abstract thinking and even thinking about mathematics itself. So they talked about the philosophy of mathematics. So they talked about the concept of pure number. It's called arithmos, what we might call number theory. So they, they abstracted that. So uh, they, they, they took numbers and, and said, well, what, is it, what does a number really mean? You know, is, and what does it mean to count things and to add things? What does that actually mean as an as a, as a, uh, abstract idea? And they even thought in abstract terms about geometry. So geometric figures, for example, a point, a line, a rectangle, a circle, exist only in the realm of thinking. They were idealized objects. So a point, you know, is what is it? It's a location only. It has no size. You can't really draw a point. As soon as you put a dot on a paper, that dot has some size to it. Of course, otherwise you couldn't see it. So... We have to have imperfect rep representations, but the idealized thing, the point, actually has no size. And of course, what, of course, what is a line? A line is just a bunch of points lined up. And so it has length, uh, length or infinite length if it's a line, or a line segment has a finite length. But it, but it uh, 
contains infinitely many points, but they have no thickness. So again, you really couldn't see it. Uh, when we draw it, we're drawing a imperfect representation of that object. And this, this idea was heavily influenced by Platonic philosophy. We'll get to be talking about uh, some of the specific mathematicians and Plato being among them uh, in some of the later videos.